Governor Charlie Baker in attendance for some Ivy League hoops. Siani Chambers looking for another conference title. First half, Chambers find Aguna Ukuli for the two-handed jam. Look at that, celebrations going on. Wesley Saunders, Ivy League Player of the Year, gets the tough runner to fall. And now he finished with 11. But Yale is a feisty group. Second half now, Justin Sears grabs the offensive rebound, stuffs it home like a Thanksgiving turkey. And Sears, here he is again, not known for his three ball, but knocks this one in and he throws up the three goggles. Now Harvard is keeping it close though. Mondo Missy with another hoop. He had, had a team high of 21 points. But in the end, there was too much Javier Duran. The cross over and the jumper seals the win for Yale, 62-52. Can you say one game playoff? That's one of the beauties of, of our league. It can be hard and challenging, as we know. Um, but, you know, we, we have to turn the page. We're going to lose a draw. We're ready to you know, move on to the next night and the next opponent. And I'm very hopeful that, you know, with tomorrow night being senior night, you know, our ability to, to focus in and to try to finish the right way. And finish the right way the Crimson did. Hello and welcome to this week's Boston College Roundup. I'm Jessica Griffith. Harvard needed two things to happen in order to force a one-game playoff for the Ivy League Championship. It needed to beat Brown and needed Dartmouth to upset Yale. And believe it or not, both of them happened. In the one-game playoff, Harvard beat Yale by two. The Crimson are one of the three local teams to make it to the big dance and Lucas Frankel sat down with EEI's John Rook to help break down their chances in the big dance. So we are here with WEEI Providence's John Rook. John, how you feeling today? Good, good. Thanks, Lucas. Appreciate that, man. So March Madness is here. Most exciting time of the year, isn't it? Absolutely. It's my two favorite days of the entire year are the Thursday and Friday of the first <laughs> week of the NCAA tournament because everybody's just bumped and jacked and all 64 teams all have a hope to win a national title, right? That's right. So three New England teams. I mean, I, that's pretty mm -hmm. unprecedented, if I can remember. You've got Harvard, Northeastern, and Providence. Mm -hmm. Let's start with the Crimson. Fourth straight year in the tournament. They were really successful last year. How do you kind of see them shaking, off, shaking out in the tournament this year? You know, I, I think that they were somewhat fortunate to even get in this year. Um, they had to have, you know, help getting in when uh, Yale lost their final regular season game to Dartmouth in the Ivy League. So I think that they're kind of fortunate to be where they are. They kind of put this thing away early in the year. They didn't do it. They were able to get in there, but I think North Carolina is going to be a little bit too athletic for them to probably handle in the long run. UNC's Roy Williams getting ready to take on former Dukey Tommy Amaker. Harvard got off to the hot start. Ivy League player of the year, Wesley Saunders with a step back jumper. Pure on that one. On to the second half now. Bryce Johnson misses the hook shot, but JP Tokido is there to clean it up. Let's see this again. Tokido with the rebound and finish. What a play later in the second. Harvard down just two. We see Siani Chambers. The three plus the foul, Harvard's bench, absolutely loving this. They got the Google eyes, a big time player, hitting a big time shot in a big time game. What a play by Siani Chambers. He would miss his next three though, and the long rebound leads to a fast break for the Tar Heels, and it's Margaret's page to Justin Jackson for the go ahead slam. One last chance for the Crimson. Saunders three is gonna hit the back iron, and the Tar Heels escape by the skin of their teeth, 67. 65. Move on to Northeastern. First tournament appearance in 24 years. What can we expect from the Huskies? You know, that's a great question because I'm not even sure the Huskies know. Uh, they have a hell of a matchup with Notre Dame just to kind of start it off, so I think it'll be interesting. If anybody could sneak up on one of the big dogs, and I think a lot of people around the country like Notre Dame because they won the ACC tournament, Northeastern could be that kind of team. As long as they can play their game and don't get wowed by the it factor and you know don't get uh, completely taken in by the whole Golden Dome. and you know, I don't know if those kids will be intimidated at all. They're Boston kids, right? <laughs> So I don't think they'll be too intimidated. I think that they can probably hang with Notre Dame for a while, but it'll be a handful for Northeastern. So we got Jerry and Grant and Bill Cohen getting set for Notre Dame against Northeastern early in the first half. Northeastern Scott Erling is Boston strong power drill, pump fake and finish in traffic. He finished with 18 points, but as good as Etherton was, Zach August was the best big man on the court. A little post up action here, and Demetrius Jackson puts on a ball handling display. Watch this. Slick handles and finds August on the break for the easy dunk. The Irish love it, and August would finish with 25 points. Northeastern would not go down without a fight. Etherton slips the screen for the uncontested lay-in to cut the lead to four. 
but when it mattered most, Notre Dame's defense showed up. Quincy Ford loses the handle. Grant gets his hands on the ball, and the Irish come away with it, and they'll advance 67-65. Heartbreak on Huntington Avenue. So close, so close. Those were equally devastating losses for the Huskies and the Crimson. But if any of the three local teams had a chance to advance, it was the six-seeded Providence Friars. Lucas? So let's move on to your Friars. Second straight year in the tournament under Coach Ed Cooley. No Bryce Cotton this year. How do you think the Friars kind of stack up this year? I actually think that they're a better team this year than they were last year because they have a two-pronged attack with uh, Chris Dunn, who's one of the best point guards in the country that probably a lot of people won't have heard of until this next week. And then LaDante Hinton, who led the, uh, the Big East in scoring this year. And Providence is already, I think, a lot of people's uh, sort of um, – uh, hidden factor, secret Sweet 16 possibility, uh, upset special, if you will. And I tend to agree. I think the Friars have enough talent to be playing on the second weekend. Ed Cooley and Archie Miller set to do battle, but it was turnover city early for the Friars to steal and a foul here. Sloppy pass leads here, leads to a fast break for the Flyers. Pascal Chukwunabu. With the land 16 turnovers on the day for the Friars. Andy Dalton to make them pay. Suchi Smith with the scoop shot. It goes. More defense from Dayton. Chris Dunn, Chris Dunn goes for the dunk. And Kenan Pollard says, this is my block party and you are not invited. Watch this again. Unbelievable. And from there, Dyshawn Pierre took over from three. Here's one from the right wing. Just a few minutes later, he lets it fly from the left wing. Cash money on that one. He finished with a game high 20 points. And he wasn't done. The pump fake and three, the old-fashioned way for Pierre and the Flyers advance 66-53. They'll take on Oklahoma in the next round. While Boston College may not have made the NCAA tournament, the Eagles went out with a bang on senior night. We'll be right back. Neither Boston College nor Wake Forest will make the NCAA tournament, so their regular season finale was just really a battle for bragging rights. But for eight Eagles players, it was much more than that. It was senior night, a game to appreciate all the hard work they put in over the past four years. And trust me, it could not have gone any better. A huge crowd on hand to support Boston College's senior night as they took on Wake Forest. Here we have the first play of the game, Cody Miller-McIntyre with the drive, the bump, and the finish. He led the Deacons with 24 points. But the Eagles would answer. The ball finds its way to Olivier Hanlon in the corner for three. Eagles now up early. Up next is the second half. The Demon Deacons with some beautiful ball movement. Devin Domas takes a high-low pass and finishes in traffic. But then it started raining triples in Conti Forum. Hanlon drives, draws the D, and kicks it out to Eddie O.D. from the wing. Now later in the half, it's Hanlon doing it himself, off the dribble and swish. And to put the icing on the cake, Stephen Perpiglier finds Garland Owens for the monster slam. The Eagles go nuts and they win big on senior night, 79-61. I mean, it was great. It's been a great four years. I know we had a lot of up and downs, but the season was special. And um, this team is great. Coaches were great. so. Yeah, it was, a, it was a good moment to come off the, t off the court in front of all the fans, and um, I'll miss it. The Eagles ended the regular season on a three-game winning streak. And as we all know, momentum in sports is crucial. So after a dominating performance on senior night, BC was feeling good about their chances in the upcoming ACC tournament. Colby Smallzell has the story. A rivalry considered one of the best in college basketball. The Boston College Eagles took on the Wake Forest Demon Deacons on their senior night in the last regular season game of the Atlantic Coast Conference. The Eagles came out on top 79-61. to Senior Patrick Heckman looks back on his final home game. I mean, it was great. It's been a great four years. I know we had a lot of up and downs, but the season was special. And um, this team is great. Coaches were great. So, yeah, it was a, it was a good moment to come off the, t off the court in front of all the fans. And um, I'll miss it. Point guard Olivier Hanlon shared similar feelings. And I was just happy for the seniors today. You know, everybody stepped up, and I'm happy that, you know, they had a good time with their last game here, so it was a success. Hanlon finished strong with 19 points and 8 assists, but wouldn't take all the credit. 
I think I got a lot better off the balance and just pulling up and just make it look kind of easy sometimes, but it's definitely credit to him and the coaching staff. Wake Forest put up a decent fight, but couldn't seem to hit the shots they needed, losing control of the ball on many occasions. Head coach of the Eagles, Jim Christensen, talked about his first year coaching in the ACC and how he has prepared this team for tournament. When you get opportunities to win, you've got to win because there's going to be some times in this league where you play really, really well and lose. It's just the nature of the beast, and we've done that too. The Eagles face the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets on Tuesday in the first round of the playoffs. Reporting for WEBN Boston, I'm Colby Smallzell. And we welcome back Lucas Frankel to the desk. Thanks, Jess. Let's change gears from the hardwood to the ice. The bean pot is an annual tradition here in Boston, and the snow may have delayed the championship game for two weeks, but that did not stop fans from filling TD Garden to capacity. BU versus Northeastern for all the marbles. The championship game may have been delayed two weeks, but that nothing was going to slow down Mike Malone. Fast break opportunity, nothing but net, and he puts it home. One, nothing, Terriers. Less than a minute later, the Huskies would respond. John Stevens loses the puck, recovers, and goes top shelf on Clay Witt. We are tied at one. Huskies looking for that bean pot championship. Let's move on to the third period. BU up 3-2, and there's going to be a scrum in front of the net. Who has the puck? Who has the puck? I don't know. I can't see it. But somehow Dustin DeRue sneaks it past the crease, and we are headed to overtime. One minute into the extra period, and Matt Grizzlechick buries the wrister, and BU wins the bean pot 4-3. Let the celebrations begin on Commonwealth Avenue. A big reason for the Terriers' success this season is the mix of young talent and veteran leaders. And no player exemplifies that more than J.D. Carabino, who is one of three senior captains on the team. Our Maggie Smolka has more. Even at the young age of three, J.D. Carabino was fascinated with hockey. I was watching hockey game with my dad and my mom. And uh, I was like, you know, I really want to do that. And a three-year-old, however a three-year-old would say that. But he took a skating class for the first time and... Got on the ice and cried my way all the way off. When he was five, he hit the rink again, and the now Boston University hockey athlete has been playing the sport ever since. When you're on the ice, there's people are always like, oh, did you hear me yell your name? Did you hear me say this? Did you hear me say that? No, you don't really hear anything. You just kind of hear loud noises, and you know, people say you're in the zone. It's, it's true. You, everything's kind of in the moment, and you're focused on the task at hand, which is winning the hockey game or doing the job that you need to do on the ice. It's this focus and dedication while on the ice that drives his love for the game. Well, it's just like anything else. You put in the time and the work and the success comes after that. And his hard work has paid off, especially this past year. In the span of one month, we have three championships and we're looking at a fourth. I don't think anything's ever going to be able to touch this season. He says it's an indescribable feeling when his team wins these championships. You can't really describe it. It's pretty, it's like a, it's like an overwhelming emotional thing just because you've worked your whole life for it. Right now, Carabino is hoping to play somewhere professionally for at least a year, even if it's minor pro. In Boston, Maggie Smolka, WEBN. Thanks, Maggie. Patricia Nicholas will join us in just a minute to look at Carabino's final few games. The bean pot wasn't the only collegiate hockey going on. Just down the road, Harvard hosted Princeton in a battle of the two smartest hockey teams in the country. Two of the smartest hockey teams in America squaring off here, but they can get a little physical too. Harvard Max Everson lays out the Tiger Skater with that hip check. Now that's one way to stop a rush. Now next up we have some offense for the Crimson. On the power play, Kyle Criscolo wraps around the shot and finds pay dirt. Assisted by Sean Malone, Harvard goes up 1-0 and it would only continue. Up next, Princeton with the, their best scoring chance of the day and Steve Michalik swallows up the shot. Now for this game, he had 27 saves on the day. Up next, nice puck movement here from Crimson and it's Tyler Moy with the wicked wrist up past Colton Finney. Harvard goes up 3-0 and they'd on, add on two more goals en route to a 5-0 victory. The Frozen Four is rapidly approaching, and joining us now to help sort out the madness is Patricia Nichols. Patricia? Thanks, Jess. That's right. Four of the best collegiate hockey teams are headed to Boston this weekend, but for one team, the journey to the Garden is just a train ride away.
coach has said all year that nobody can beat us, we can only beat ourselves. That's Boston University's mindset heading into the weekend as they take on North Dakota. It's a clash between the second and third ranked teams in the country. The Terriers are led by freshman sensation Jack Eichel, who leads the country with 67 points on the year. He's one of the four Terriers with at least 20 goals this year. BU's Matt O'Connor is also one of the best goaltenders in the country. And this is a confident team heading into the weekend. When we play our best, there's nobody that can even come close to us. Now, on the other side of the bracket, Providence will be taking on Omaha. This is the first time in 20 years that two teams from the same region have reached the Frozen Four on their home turf. For WBN, I'm Trish Nicholas. Thanks, Patricia. Now, when we come back, two local Boston teams scrimmaged the Boston Red Sox. Find out how they did. And one local Division Three star led his team to the Final Four. Do not go away. One of the perks of playing baseball at Northeastern is, is you get to play against professional competition. And I don't mean future MLB players, I'm talking about the Boston Red Sox. Every year the Sox play a split squad scrimmage against two local Boston area teams. This year, Boston College and Northeastern had the honor. Rick Porcello in mid-season form already. One strikeout. Two strikeouts. Two scrollless innings for Porcello and two strikeouts looking good early. Northeastern's Aaron Carvalho had his A-game stuff too. Sit down, Hanley Ramirez, the college kid, besting the $90 million man. Huskies on offense now. Joey Scambia hits the grounder to first play. It's going to be misplayed, and Rob Fonseca comes all the way home, and he will score for the Huskies. Northeastern goes up early, but in the ninth inning, the Sox would strike back. Henry Ramos bloops one into the left field corner. Brock Holt chugging around third. He'll score in the Sox. Squeak out the 2-1 win over the Huskies. Brian Rapp getting the start for the Eagles, and he was throwing professional league heat. Jackie Bradley Jr., better luck next time. Now we're going to fast forward to the sixth. Jeff Murphy on the mound, and Jameel Weeks rips it down the line. It would rattle around the corner, and BC can't seem to catch up with the ball. Weeks would churn his way to third. Now both teams are wearing number three for former BC player Pete Frady, so I can't tell who's who. All I know is that was an amazing triple. Two batters later, Blake Swihart says, say hello to my little friend and rips the game-winning single up the middle. Weeks would score, Sox win, one nothing. Joining us now to talk about a special tribute before the Boston College yeah, Red Sox ready. game is Eli Kel Abrams. So Eli, what were the two teams honoring before the first pitch? Thanks. Some of you may remember the ALS Ice Challenge from earlier this summer. Some of you have may have even made a video, but few know how this all actually started. It started here on the campus of BC, where BC baseball player Pete Frades was first diagnosed with, all, with Lou Gehrig's disease. He is the reason that it all started. Every year in spring training, the Boston Red Sox and the Eagles honor Frades. And what better way to do so than this? Every player, manager, and coach on both sides wore Frady's number three jersey as a tribute to one of baseball's biggest fighters. But that's not all. Frady's father, sister, wife, and daughter were called to the mound before the game to give the managers the game ball. It was a very touching moment for everyone involved. Frades was unable to attend this game in particular, but vows to attend the home opener of the BC Eagles later on this month. At BC, I'm Eli Abrams for BN News. Thank you, Eli. Coming up next, a look into the new MAC playoffs and a Cinderella run into the tournament for one of the teams. Welcome back. Division I schools get most of the attention in this area. But that doesn't mean we don't take notice of the accomplishments of Division III teams and athletes. Joining us now to shine a spotlight on those smaller schools is our D3 expert, Isaac Moore. Isaac? Thanks, Jess. It was a crazy season in the new MAC. Four different teams were ranked at one point this season, and every game seemingly came right down to the wire. Babson finished with a 13-1 conference record and ended up hosting the new MAC playoffs, so let's get right to the action. 
Tim Swenson, a future doctor, getting ready to face off against WPI. First half, John Doncaster off the screen. A little hesitation and the floater. He would have a big role in this game. Good defense now leads to good offense. Sean Martin with the fast break. He would finish it nicely right here and finish with a game high 16 points. Pride were cooking on offense though. John Altman right here with a nice little pull up jumper sinks it. And then later in the half, Martin with the play of the game. Nice little spin move here on Doncaster and gets it to go. They would have a 10 point lead. Now Doncaster would get his revenge later however. A little pick and roll action here to Matacusa for the deuce cutting the lead down to only three. But the engineers couldn't get a stop when they needed it most. Altman finds Larry Piercha over here in the corner for the three. He would finish with four three-pointers on the game. Last chance for WPI in the full court heave is broken up. Springfield holds on to win 51-46. They would face the winner of Babson MIT. So let's get right to that game next. Eric Dean, the captain, looking to lead Beavers against MIT. First half, Ryan Frankel throws the lob to Matt Redfield for the emphatic dunk. Redfield had his handprints all over this game. Here's B Babson's Johnny Wicky. Nice hook shot for him right there. Final seconds now of the first half. Frankel would turn the ball over. Dean would come up with it, and he would end up throwing up a last-second heave and hits it right before the buzzer. Buzzer beater gave them a four-point lead heading into the locker room and more importantly, a little momentum. Second half here, Joey Flannery taking over in transition. Nice little and one drive. MIT still fighting though. Justin Pedley misses the three. Redfield comes up with it. One of his 17 rebounds of the game resets the offense. Another missed layup here, but Redfield with the tip back in. He would finish with a double-double. But in the end, just too much Beavers inside. Bradley Jacks showing immense effort here. First, block, get, uh, first attempt gets blocked but he would finish with the reverse and the foul. His teammates love it, he loves it, and Babson is moving on. Here's coach Steven Brennan on the matchup against Springfield. Springfield, they're gonna use their length and try and shoot over the top, and you know, they, um, they, they score the ball really well. They're sneaky in transition. Babson hosting the new MAC championship game for the first time in 20 years. It was Joey Flannery show early on. Babson works the ball to him, and he gets a nice little floater here to go for the first points of the game. Next possession now, Beavers get out on the break. It's Sam Bo Miller. He's not looking for a shot, though. He's looking for Joey Flannery, and for good reason. Sinks the triple. He gets the first five points of the game. Springfield will keep it close, though. Nice passing from the pride. Tim Swenson finds a cutting Alex Garska for the easy layup. But Flannery was a possessed man in this game. Second half, the defense is, the defense is just helpless. The drive and the finish for Flannery. He would finish with a game-high 30 points. And let's not forget, guys, he's only a sophomore. It's still a game, though, with four minutes to go. Swenson finds Altman cutting down the lane. He would put it in to keep, the, keep it 61-55. Babson with the lead, and they wouldn't loosen their grip. Johnny Wicky with the wide open underneath the net for the easy layup. Babson Beavers are your 2015 NUMAC champions. Joey Flannery is your tournament MVP. Babson, Springfield, and WPI all made the Division III NCAA tournament. Springfield lost to Albertus Magnus in the first round, and WPI lost to St. John Fisher. But Babson made up for both those losses and more. The Beavers went on to win four games in the tournament and reached the Final Four, or as it's known to some, the National Semifinals. However, Babson lost by 20 points to Augustana of Illinois to cap off its best season in school history. The biggest reason for the Beavers' success this season was the play of sophomore Joey Flannery. He's not just one of the best players in the new MAC. He's one of the best D3 players in the entire country. For the second season in a row, Flannery was named the new MAC Player of the Year. He was also voted the Northeast District Player of the Year. And if that wasn't enough, he was named the D3Hoops.com First Team All-American. Of the 20 All-Americans, he's one of only two sophomores in Babson's first since 1992. Flannery averaged 22 points this season and 6.5 and rebounds while shooting nearly 50% from the floor. And that's your D3 segment, so back to you guys at the desk. Wow, that's incredible, Jess. And to think something like that was going on in our own backyard all year long and not many people noticed. That sums it up for this edition of Boston College Sports Roundup. I'm Lucas Frankel. And I'm Jessica Griffith. Thanks for watching and make sure to tune in next time too.